Hi everyone, uh, my name's Dave Rowland. I'm the Director of Software Development at Traction. Um, I'm mainly responsible for our now open source DAW engine, um, but also our DAW waveform, and I oversee the plugin side of our company as well. Um, one of my roles as part of that is that I'm responsible for all of our build systems and CI. Um, so I'm gonna share today a few of the lessons that we've learned over the past couple of years, adding that into our build chain. Um, quick note before we get started though, we announced a, a whole bunch of developer initiatives last week, and as this is a developer conference, I thought I might as well list them out. So as I mentioned, our traction engine, our DAW engine, is now open source, and this really enables you to build anything from kind of small playback synthesizer type apps to fully, fully featured DAWs, so check that out if that kind of thing interests you. We have our verify by plugin valve scheme, which I'll talk about more towards the end of the presentation, and also our Traction Presents distribution uh, partnership. And this is really if you're kind of a small or an independent plugin company. We know it can be quite difficult once you've built something great to actually bring it to market. So we're help, uh, helping to kind of form partnerships to deal with some of the web licensing and marketing issues around so you can kind of focus on your products. So do get in contact if that kind of thing is of interest to you as well. A few quick notes. Uh, first of all, the slides are numbered, so if you have a question about a specific slide, um, make a note the number and I can jump back to it quickly. And also the presentation will be on GitHub afterwards, so you can check it out there. So what we're gonna talk about today, well, uh, first of all, we're gonna look at the landscape of developing plugins and how this might differ from other software development. Then we're gonna look at some of the common problems between hosts and plugins and where these can um, arise from and then how we can use testing to improve our confidence when releasing software. And to that end, we're gonna talk about plugin a tool we've created to kind of help this um, confidence and how we can use these things to move towards standards compliance. So part one, developing plugins. What's the landscape of plugin development? If you're developing a plugin today, what kind of things do you have to consider? Well, first of all, you'll probably be targeting three OS's, Windows, Mac, and increasingly Linux these days, becoming very popular. Um, I'm kind of ignoring the fact that Linux comes in two dozen odd varieties, um, but that's something to be aware of as well. We have four major plugin formats, VST3, VST, uh, Audio Unit on the Mac, and if you're targeting Pro Tools, you'll be dealing with AAX as well. These days, still two architectures. 32-bit is kind of on the decline, but we're still actively supporting it. Um, it'll be good when we can focus solely on 64-bit. And then in terms of hosts, I kind of had a quick look on Wikipedia. There's at least 12 sort of major well-recognized hosts, but there's probably 12 that you will also have heard of, and then there are a whole bunch on top of that, some for specific use cases like uh, video editing or uh, score editors and things. So basically, this number goes off into infinity. And in terms of kind of formats and platforms, iOS and AUV3, those are becoming more and po more popular these days. So again, more things to think about. So if you multiply all these numbers together, you end up with this 288 environments to test figure. And that's a huge number. That's a huge number of places that your code can end up being run on. It's much bigger than a standard desktop piece of software. So if I take a real quick, brief history lesson, plugin development started way back Essentially with VST, uh, VST spec, um, it was roughly an API of around 23 calls. Um, some of those kind of only got called once. And it basically encompassed, this is a bit of a simplification, but the state of your plugin, how it was being processed, the sample rate block size, your parameters, um, a program list that you had, and then your DSP kind of slotted into the middle of that. There were optional advanced features like buses, double precision, but you could kind of ignore those for the large part. And this was a relatively small number of things to keep in your head. You could kind of manage this whole state of your plugin. Over the years, more uh, plugin formats emerged for different platforms, and then Juice came along to kind of unify all those to create uh, cross-platform plugins um, on multiple operating systems. So it's essentially a lowest common denominator implementation based primarily on the VST spec. And to build a plugin in Juice, you had to essentially implement audio processor. This kind of was about 40 calls, virtual methods that you had to implement. Um, again, relatively small number of things to keep in your head when you're building a plugin. However, moving on a few years, um, 
things have changed a bit. Hosts and plugin formats have more and more features these days, and as a result, that audio processor has features added to it and bits broken out into new classes. So you also have to be aware of audio processor parameter. They're kind of a separate notion to the processor these days. We have buses and audio channel sets that describe them. We have audio processor parameter groups for hierarchical parameters. And uh, you might have audio playhead, current position info that you need to be aware of, and kind of smaller things like track properties, curve data, et cetera. Um, the reason I mention all of these is most of these things are either present in their own files or reference to audio processor. An audio processor, the header file, is 1,600 lines of code. So that's a huge onslaught of information, especially if you're new to the world of plugin development. And it's also worth pointing out that the comment block for process block function is 63 lines on its own. And that's 63 lines of things you should know or caveats or behavioral things that you need to be aware of. So what does all of this kind of encompass in terms of features? Well, we have our parameters and their values, names, labels, text readouts, defaults, suffixes, steps, categories, et cetera. We have processing in single, double precision, bypassed. If you're host, you might have to deal with suspension and also real-time or rendering processing, and you might be dealing with file reading differently, whether you're real-time or rendering, for example. Then we have playhead information and tempo, key, position, playing, recording states. We have channel layout and bus enablement. Uh, latency you have to think about, obviously state restoration, your program list. You might be thinking about things such as MPE compatibility. Then we have our listener classes that kind of bind all this together. We might have format-specific extra functions like automation state. I haven't even mentioned editors yet. That's a whole uh, thing. And more and more these days, we're dealing with scale factors and resizable UIs, especially if you're targeting um, you know, iOS or iPad, et cetera. Um, high DPI, we also have to be aware of. That might influence how you write your interface. Um, then, again, more format-specific things like parameter control highlight info, host MIDI controller presence, and so on. There's lots lots more to keep in your head when you're developing a plugin, and you kind of have to be aware of all of these because they're presented to you. So what we end up with here is essentially 100 odd features or calls or things that can happen to your plugin. And if we multiply that by our complexity before uh, of sort of number environments, we end up with what I'm calling the complexity factor. It's kind of a loose number, but essentially we have nearly 30,000 different places that can get called into our code in a different environment. And essentially, because plugins are complex interwoven things, when we make a change, we, this can affect the whole plugin. So this is the number we have to think about. We haven't talked about one thing yet, though. That's right, we haven't talked about threads. Of course, threads look like this in your program. Nice, completely independent, concurrent threads of execution. But really, threads look like this. Um, so threading is a complex issue. Not all plugin APIs mention threads, or if they do, they don't all necessarily agree on a threading model. Um, this is partially for historical reasons. I believe early formats were um, running on systems that didn't even have threads, so everything might be single-threaded apart from the audio callback that might be on a hardware interrupt. So threading just wasn't a thing when these were devised. But we do have threads these days, and what this means is that we essentially have to assume the worst. We have to assume if nobody agrees on what is called on what thread and when, we have to kind of assume the worst, have to be pessimistic about this. So when we're thinking about the threads in plugins, we essentially have at least two threads. We have the message and the audio thread, but sometimes we have more. We have um, threads for perhaps passes, passing messages between the audio and the message thread, we have uh, threads for doing uh, background rendering of graphics. We might have threads that are scanning our file system for preset files. We might have threads that are prefetching audio samples and things like that. So really, in the best case scenario, we have two threads and we multiply our complexity factor up, we get to nearly 60,000. But in reality, plugins are probably dealing with somewhere between five and 10 threads. So we end up with a complexity of nearly 300,000. So this is the number of threads that could be calling 100 odd calls on around 300 different operating systems, plugin formats, and platforms, which is just a huge number of things to you know, consider when you're developing software. And this is really what leads us to this. Has anyone ever heard this? 
Right, so why is it that your plugin works in some hosts and not others? And if you're hosting plugins, why is it you can host some plugins and not others? Where, where do these problems arise from? So I'll go through some quick examples of things that I've uh, seen. This, doesn't, this isn't an exhaustive list, but it will help you get an idea of where things can arise from. So it can be really simple things. It could just be a basic matter of coverage. You know, hosts aren't calling all methods, and possibly as a result, if you're developing a plugin and you're testing in a specific host, it might be that plugins, uh, that you don't get called on all methods, so you just don't know these things. We had an example where we were trying to load a plugin, and on instantiation, we just called get parameter text on all the methods so we could send it off to a control surface that had all the values, um, but a plugin, once we got past the kind of the well-tested number, we would just crash on a certain point, um, reading parameter 100 and something. But it worked in other hosts because they just weren't reading these high number parameters. It can be that hosts do unexpected things. This can be especially relevant if you're new to the world of plugin development. Um, for example, prepare to play can be called with a block size X, let's say 512. Um, but then subsequently process block can be called with a size much less than X. It could be um, 64 or 128. And this is common for a number of reasons. It, um, I have seen hosts chop up uh, MIDI buffers into smaller chunks, so they kind of process those individually. We use it for fine grain automation if we have LFOs creating modulation or even just kind of jaggedy curves then um, we kind of chop these up into smaller blocks to reduce parameter aliasing and give a more faithful representation to the automation. But again, if you're new, this is a kind of unusual thing to see. On the other side of that, it could be that plugins do unexpected things. Um, they might block the message thread and they might open modal registration and authorization windows. Not only is this annoying, especially if you're scanning plugins in the background and you constantly bombarded with registration dead, uh, windows. Um, it can cause deadlocks. We did have an experiment a few years ago where we tried to load plugins on a background thread because then we could keep our UI responsive and our progress meters could carry on. But then we ended up in this horrible deadlock situation where plugins were opening um, modal dialogues on the wrong threads and it, we had to revert that, it just didn't work. So now we just pause periodically when we're loading plugins. In a kind of uh, slightly more scary way, we have seen plugins trying to write files on instantiation. Uh, VST plugins traditionally installed to this directory. Um, however, this is in program files. And I don't know exactly why they might need to write files. It could be that they're expanding some compressed content and trying to load that out so they can read it quicker. It might be that plugins are downloading something from the internet and using those as resources. However, this is going to fail on modern OSs, and it's going to fail for good reason. If you were to type this problem into the internet, you might get this advice, though, run as an administrator. However, that's not a good idea, because if your host or a plugin or any plugin that you were, happen to be hosting was to be compromised or a security hole found, then someone could use that, maliciously use that, to gain access to your entire system because you're running as an administrator. They could install keyloggers, download more software, make you part of a botnet, who knows what could happen. And also, it wouldn't be difficult to deliberately create a malicious plugin. How often does free audio plugin get typed into the internet? I'd imagine quite a lot. So I mentioned threading earlier, but we can also have disagreements in threading models, and this, can be a really wide source of errors. And I say it's a wide source of errors because they tend to linger, and they linger because they're difficult to track down. If they cause race conditions, we can end up with heap corruptions that often manifest just much <coughs> later from the cause. And this means they're really non-obvious in log files because they might you know, be crashing in a completely unrelated place. So to that end, we can you know, have assumptions are made. So plugins can make assumptions that calls will only be made from certain threads or that they won't be made concurrently with other calls. For example, we might be calling process block on the audio thread, and before that we might be calling set parameter to um, run some automation, but then uh, as part of the host you might have a UI knob, perhaps it's attached to a macro that controls other knob, uh, parameters um, that's called, so then we end up calling set parameter from the audio thread and the message thread. On the other side of this, hosts can make assumptions as well. Um, 
get playhead at the bottom here is a method that should only really be called from inside process block because that's the only time we actually have a valid play context. But um, hosts make optimizations to avoid calling process block where possible. It could be that there's no content uh, like clips or regions for a specific time area, or it could be that they just don't call process for their entire <laughs> audio graph when they're paused. But plugins might want to update their UI, they might want to show the current tempo, or if they're doing sequencing, they might want to show progress through that, etc. So it's a common thing that they'll want to find this information out continuously. So what I have seen is that being called on a timer, and a timer delegates this to the message thread. Now we're in violation of get playhead being called from inside process block, but we have to deal with this. So where do, what are the reasons for these things happening? Well, it's not just a poor coding, you know. It, it's, the APIs differ across formats, especially if you're writing in a cross-platform um, toolkit like Juice. It, you'll be running for lots of platforms but writing to a common API. And also, be, it's difficult and time-consuming to test every possible combination because all hosts have slightly different behavior. Remember our complexity factor of nearly 300,000? So another problem that we have is plugin and host development has historically been anecdotal and based on precedent. Whatever the first person did is kind of what everyone else has to go on. And this isn't really a good idea for conformity. Um, if we don't have concrete specs to follow, it's difficult to figure out the correct behavior. So what's the solution to this current state of affairs? Well, as I said, we essentially have to assume the worst. And if we're assuming the worst, we have to test every possibility. And if we're trying to test every possibility, we have to use all of the tools. And remember, for every change or release, you've changed the system, so you need to retest everything. And what we're aiming for by retesting everything constantly is to improve our confidence when we're making releases. We want to be able to hit go on a Friday evening, launch, and then go and enjoy our weekend, not fighting fires on a Sunday morning. So how do we go about this? Well, essentially, it's no longer viable to test with humans just due to the sheer landscape. Um, as an example, our flagship in Biotech has uh, 25,000 parameters. It's largely because we have multiple sound layers, but those are in use a lot of the time. Um, can you imagine trying to draw out 25,000 automation lanes in a two dozen hosts and then trying to run tests on that is just not really feasible. And also, humans are good at catching different things to tools. Humans are really good at UI or um, workflow issues. They're good at listening for audible defects, like, I don't know, perhaps an oscillator isn't working, or there's pops and cracks and things like that. So tools are really good at coverage, the, the time-consuming things that are um, time-consuming for people. So when we're thinking about identifying and fixing issues, because they will get reported eventually, we have to think about the cost involved in doing this. And there's a cost um, that changes depending at what point you can identify the issue. So we have to also think about the different stages once we've actually had a report come in. So there's a time to identify, and if this is coming from an end user, it might have to go through support and then they might have to contact developers to let them know there's an issue. Um, then we have to actually debug and figure out what the cause of the reported issue is, figure out a fix, and then implement the fix. Then there's a time to test this and pass on to the various test teams. And then, of course, there's time taken to actually get a release out to the wild. And for each stage, don't think about just your personal development time that it takes to do this. Think about everyone involved in this release cycle. So as I mentioned, support might be involved. It takes their time to interact with the user and then contact development. And then you have QA. Their time is involved to actually test the things that you've done. Then you might have web. They might need to spend time updating and um, uh, downloads on the internet. And uh, you might have marketing that needs to send out um, emails to customers to let them know there's new releases. So if you think about the time it takes for each of these parties involved, and then think about how much you pay them per hour, we can kind of end up with a cost related to fixing an issue. And as I said, the time it takes varies depending at what, which stage 
in the development cycle you can catch things. So I'm gonna run through this list really quickly. It's basically uh, things that are quick to identify at the top and things that uh, take a long time to identify down the bottom. So we have instantaneous things like live issues. Then we have uh, compiler warnings and errors and we can crank these up to the max to catch the most number of things and we can use things like treat warnings and errors to reject from remotes if um, they cause problems. We have static analyzers that are essentially a different compilation process. Then runtime tests like ASAN and TSAN, UBSAN and Belgrind. Um, I run with ASAN on about 95% of the time and TSAN another few percent of the time. These tools are so good now that you can run them um, pretty much constantly. And also, um, they not only help you identify things, but they help you de uh, fix things quicker because they give you more information about the cause of problems. Then we have unit tests that are run during initialization often. Um, we have automated testing, which might be things like load in projects and state from the command line. We have validation tools, there's AUVAL on the Mac, AXVAL, VST scanner, and PluginVAL, which we'll come on to. Then fuzzers, which can also be part of the validation tools. Onto the human side of things, we have QA that are particularly good at targeted testing. We can feed them with, you know, check out this new feature or this fix that I've done. Then we move on to private beta testers. These are often doing the job for free, which means that they're particularly good at ta uh, testing their own workflows, the common things that are, they do. Um, and it's essential if you're dealing with beta testers that you make the bug reporting process um, easy because then you can actually make this a useful phase. Beyond that, we might have a public beta phase, which is similar to private, but perhaps we have less direction um, for what they can test. Then we have release, which is always revealing. This is where we explode from our kind of small number of environments into every possible environment out there. Then we have things like sales weekends, which can cause upticks in sales, hopefully. And uh, these can stress new things like download bandwidth that uh, you might not have tested before. And of course, new product releases. It's similar to a release, but you don't have as much information to go on as in the past. And of course, new products are often combined with sales, so we get a double whammy here. So if we kind of think about the cost of uh, fixing and identifying an issue at each of these stages, we get roughly this exponential shape, depending on um, how far through the development stage we are. So at the left, we have our live issues. Somewhere in the middle, we've got automated testing. And towards the end, we've got identifying an issue at full release for an end user. So what we're looking to do is move issues that we typically identify on the right-hand side and move them to the left so they cost us less money and less time. So how do we do this? Well, essentially, we improve the things that we have control over, things that we can do as developers to improve this process. And this basically, um, one prime example of this is tools and automated testing. So with that in mind, I'm gonna introduce PluginVal. Um, PluginVal originally came about because I was looking for an AUVAL-like tool that, be, that could be used cross-platform, Mac, Windows, and Linux, and could test all the plugin formats that Juice supported. And I wanted it to be made easily part of automated workflows and CI. I quickly realized that this should be an open source tool, not only to enable contri community contributions and everyone to kind of get involved, but also because it can be a great teaching tool. If, uh, especially if someone new to plugin development validates their plugin and it highlights an issue, they should be able to go to the source of that test and there should be a comment or some explanation to say why that behavior was being tested to improve the information there. So quick history, started life as adding command line options to our DAW waveform, to open sessions, run tests, et cetera. But we were developing plugins at this point and we realized we we're testing our DAW at the same time as our plugins and the DOW is a kind of constantly evolving thing as well. So what we really wanted to do, um, and this is, is quite heavyweight to run, is create a standalone tool that basically replicated AUVAL, but again, for all due supported formats, then we can really focus on the plugins. However, I quickly realized we can go way beyond what AUVAL offers here um, and do lots more testing. And also, I added some UI so it can be used as part of um, you know, other humans outside of the developers like QA, beta testers, and end users, et cetera. Uh, it was interesting when I was creating this, I was sort of writing tests, testing our plugins, and then finding issues, and then realizing that we could test more things, so I'd write more tests and then test the plugins. And it was this fantastic sort of uh, circular improvement of things, which was great. 
Um, this is what the UI looks like. It's functionally designed, you might say, at the moment. Um, I haven't spent a lot of time on it, as you might guess. Um, it's mostly been on the back end. But it essentially has two pages. On the left, we have the um, plugin list, so you can do a scan for plugins, and then you just um, select one and scan it. Then on the right-hand side, we have uh, the log output. And at the bottom, you have a bunch of options for configuring your test. So you might be asking, what does it test? Well, primarily, it's coverage. So we will check all of your plugin info, name, version numbers, etc. But then we'll go through all of your parameters. We'll check all the big list of things that I mentioned early on. We'll open and close your editor a few times, make sure that doesn't crash or have issues. We check plugin state saving and restoration. We do audio processing in multiple block sizes and sample rates. And if you think about the number of block size and sample rates, typically three or four sample rates are used, but perhaps a dozen block sizes. This is a number that's kind of already approaching difficult for humans to test. We do sub-block processing to cover the case that I mentioned before. Uh, we test automation. We have multi-threaded state and value settings, so we kind of really hammer on threads to check that that's secure. Uh, we do bus channel, layout info, and we also check more advanced things like memory allocations on the audio thread. Although these aren't technically disallowed, you definitely don't want to do this because you're going to end up with glitches at some point. So we can check for these. Um, it says operator new here because we can check things that go via operator new. Malloc, you need debugger hooks. That's not really possible right now. But this will catch things like vector resizes and um, lots of issues. And also kind of combined with parameters, we do fuzzing. So we can just really test lots of different parameter changes constantly. And it can do all of that in essentially a few seconds. And it can do all of that every time you make a comment. So that's a huge amount of testing that you get essentially for free. And what we're really trying to fix here, or at least improve, is this statement. And this statement is really a sort of an omission that we've run out of resources. Because if you end up saying we don't support to someone, you're saying we just don't have time to test that. Um, so we're just going to say we don't support it, and that's a kind of get out clause. But that's not really good enough. Um, we can do better. Uh, all of these things, the for plugin formats are there to enable us to not get into this situation. You wouldn't buy a car, go out and drive it on a road, and then find out that half the roads are unsupported, except maybe width restrictions and toll roads. But um, you know, if you buy a car, you expect to be able to drive it anywhere. So there's a whole bunch of use cases for plugin bail. Um, Primarily, plugin developers, it's essentially a quick, easy to use validation tool uh, that can be part of CI and really goes a long way to improving our confidence when we're making releases. But we've also found it's really good for host developers because we make a host. And it's good for a number of reasons, but it's a quick way to test compatibility. So if you're developing a host and your host is juice based, you might have a bunch of plugins installed you can validate them all, and if they all pass, there's a good likelihood that they'll work with your host. If some of them do fail validation, it can be a really early identifier that you have an issue. So um, it could be a genuine bug that you need to fix in the hosting code. But if not, it could be that you've Id identified something you can just work around. Um, you know, like the example we saw earlier, perhaps you just don't call a certain method on a certain plugin. That's not ideal, but it's a pragmatic approach. Um, it's also a much quicker way of getting information between sort of different parts of your company. So um, you can get QA or users to test plugins, and this, if, if you get a good um, plugin val report from them, it can reduce the likelihood of actually having to get that plugin and test it yourself, which can be time consuming. Um, so these logs can be shared, which will, you know, you might be able to fix the issue just based on a log and get a new version out. Can you test it again? Oh, it's worked, brilliant. Um, and also, uh, it's easier to share plugin val logs with other development companies. So if you have a particular issue and you have this open source tool that generates a report, you can say, so we found this issue. Here's all the information I have on it. Um, can you perhaps tell us what's going wrong? Is there something we can do? You know, how do we proceed from here? And because it's open source, it improves transparency. You're not um, closing off your code and saying that we have an issue because then you get into a blame game. Um, this middle one here, of it reduces the likelihood of having to go through the process of testing um, a plugin or host yourself, is 
is interesting because it's essentially a long process. So if you have a report from a user that says um, that my, this plugin I'm trying in your host is failing, could be the other way around though, um, you essentially have to go through this process. You have to go to their website, you have to create an account, then you have to wait for an email verification. Once you've got that, you can finish your account creation. Then if you're lucky, you can download a demo. And if you're really lucky, the demo will be the same as the full version the end user is typically using. And if you're really, really lucky, it will be actually the same version number that they reported an issue. If that's not the case, and you can't get hold of a demo, you might have to then email support and say, I'm looking into an issue here. Is it possible to get an NFR? Then you have to wait a few days possibly to get an NFR code, then go back and redeem the NFR. Then you're at the position where you actually have something to download. So you download, install, then you have to start up your host, you do a scan. Then you have to authorize it um, or start your demo period. But then you might also have to install content. And you, certain plugins, either you might need content to run them or you most likely will need content to try and replicate the issue that a user has reported. Then this step kind of commonly gets overlooked, which is you have to learn how to use the plugin. It's very difficult to replicate user issues if you're in a completely new piece of software. So you have to familiarize yourself with it. Then you have to try and replicate the issue that was reported to you originally. And this might mean that you don't have the same setup. They might be using a particular MIDI controller that you don't have, so you might have to try and replicate that by drawing in MIDI manually. And then, of course, what often happens is it will crash and you will have very little information because there will just be a bunch of addresses that you have no information for. So then you have to contact the other party and say, hey, can you tell me what's going on here? Is there something I can do? So Plugin Val can kind of just improve this information, basically. So I briefly mentioned end users can use this as well. And this makes the reporting a lot quicker. It's much simpler for developers to look at a plugin log file than um, a stack trace with a bunch of random addresses. But of course, stack traces are very useful, uh, especially if you can re-symbolicate your side of the code, which you should be able to do. Um, but in general, if you get a bug report from a user, the more succinct and detailed the information that they can provide you, the much easier and quicker it's going to be to fix that issue. Um, if you get this doesn't work, then you haven't really got anywhere to go with that. It's going to be a long process, and that's probably going to go to the bottom of the pile. If you can get a report that says yeah, they were testing this plugin, this version number, with this set of parameters, um, which is what plugin Val gives you, then you kind of you can replicate that much quicker. So moving on to the architecture of plugin Val, as I mentioned, it's UI and command line app. We have in and out of process validation. This is useful. Um, particularly for the UI, so if you're scanning multiple plugins or even just one, the scanning can happen in a different process so it doesn't bring down the UI, which can be, um, you can lose your log file then. And um, as I said, we can scan multiple, validate multiple plugins. It's based on the Juice unit test framework, so if you're familiar with Juice and the unit test framework, you should be familiar with the way tests are run in plugin val, and this makes it really easy to contribute tests. So here's an example test. It's very simple. Um, we just inherit from plugin test. We give a name of our test and a strictness level. This is essentially how much we're going to stress the plugin with this number. So kind of quick to run things will be low numbers, and memory allocations in the audio thread would be a high number, for example. Then we have to simply override this run test method and we get past a plugin tests object, which is the juice unit test object. So you can call expect equals or log message on that. And we also get our audio plugin instance, which we can use to run tests. So as I said, this is a simple test. We simply call get state information, randomize some parameter values, and then try and restore that original state. And what we're essentially checking for here is that none of these crash. And then to add this to our list of tests that are run, we simply create a static instance of it. So it's easy to get hold of plugin Val as well. We have it available as source code on GitHub, and we run master develop branches in a similar way to Juice. It's a one-liner to clone from the terminal. Um, we'll see that next. It's self-contained, which means it includes Juice as a Git submodule, so you don't have to configure it yourself and point it 
um, at your own version of Juice, and it will always build with that version of Juice. And also, we have scripts to build and test the app. So just in the repository root slash tests, you can find those. We also have version binaries, so if you're testing against a specific version, you'll always be able to get hold of that version. And also, we have the latest binary, so if you just wanna always test against the latest version, there's a URL for that. So, these stages look like that. If you clone and build, as I said, one-liner, git clone, recur submodules, and the URL to the repository, this works with HTTPS as well, uh, or SSH. Um, then CD into the install directory and then just run the script for your relevant platform. Or you can download the latest. Mac, Linux, you can typically use curl or PowerShell on Windows. Then unzip that and you'll get a plugin, a plugin valve binary. And then to validate the plugin, you simply call the binary with an optional strictness level, five's the default, and then the validate flag with any number of paths to plugins. This is what the output looks like. It essentially gives you information at the top, and you can see the random seed is provided there, so you can also replicate that. You can feed it your own random seed now if you have a specific um, seed that's causing issues. It will tell you what it's doing at each test, and um, you'll get a stack trace if there's a crash, so you can have extra information there. And if you're lucky, you'll end up with this all test pass message at the end, which means you pass all the tests that you run. We haven't stopped with plugin valve though. Um, there's lots of things gonna be added in the future. Obviously we're adding new tests and as new things get added to Juice, we'll be supporting those. But some common requests I've got are JUnit output formatting. Hoping to add that soon. It should be relatively straightforward by just uh, iterating over the test results in the um, Juice unit test object. We can create some XML for that. Um, one thing I'm really interested in though is JavaScript bindings. This is gonna be really cool. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have reflection in C++ at the moment, which means it's gonna be quite a manual job. But what I'm hoping to do is essentially a JavaScript version of each of the plugin API calls, so then you can just write a test in JavaScript, which will look similar to the test before, and dump those in a folder, and it can just blast through all of those. It'd be a really quick way to iterate and share tests. Um, moving on from the validation side of things, though, we can also have bespoke testing. So the idea here is that we can provide known MIDI or audio input if you're in effect, and also known output, and then we can do some kind of processing and compare the known out output to what was actually produced and check for regressions or audible differences, et cetera. And if we combine that with custom JavaScript, then we essentially have a completely bespoke test uh, unit that plugin val just kind of acts as a marshal and that should be a really cool thing once we get all that up and running. So there's been a good response to plugin valve so far. Lots of people have said that they're using it. We've got around 45 stars on GitHub. These companies have contacted me directly and said, um, yeah, we're using it to help us find issues, which is cool. Interesting one here is um, Delta V Audio. They make the Spacecraft iOS app you might have heard of. Um, it's doing really well. Because this is developed in Juice and it's developed as a um, plugin format, they're actually using plugin val to validate the and test the plugin version that then gets produced as an iOS app. So that's quite a cool way of testing as well. And because there's lots of people that have come up and said they're using this, what we want to do is really promote um, testing and people that are being conscientious about their code. So as I said at the top, we're announced our verify by plugin val scheme. So what we're doing here is essentially saying, if you're doing testing, let us know and we'll just advertise that fact and let everyone else know that you're being conscientious. So all you have to do is send us a conforming log file for each plugin format on each platform and we'll add a link to your company and the various plugins there. So hopefully um, people can get involved in that. So in summary, I hope everyone's taken away today that developing plugins is hard and it's, it's hard because it's compounded by a complex landscape and also it's just hard. Um, catching bugs and issues early saves time, and therefore that saves us money. And automating testing um, can make this thing this quicker and simpler. And as part of that, plugin val can be added to your tool chain to improve test coverage. And it can also be used to speed up the bug reporting process. You know, people can send logs which will help you track down issues quicker. And as I just said, the verified plugin val scheme is going to help promote these best practices. 
So I said presentation will be available on GitHub. Um, I'll, it's not up just yet, I'll do that in a minute. Um, and you can catch me on Twitter at DROAudio for any um, conversation. So thanks very much, and are there any questions? Questions? Anyone else? Hi. Uh, as you said, we're using uh, plugin val inside Roly now, and it's been really beneficial. Um, our very early alpha stage plugins are at a level of stability that I wouldn't mm -hmm. normally have expected. Uh, however, we have run into some issues. I suppose they're rooted in the fact that it's essentially a Juice host, yeah. and that means that you're bound by the way Juice does things in in your interactions with the plugin. Yes. For example, we wanted to set parameters from both the audio thread and message thread at the same time mm -hmm. to check um, thread safety, and we found that there was a, a lock, a naughty lock inside Juice, which was mm -hmm. protecting this. Um, is, is Are there ways around this? Is there something we can do to um, get around this? Is this just something that we need to ask Juice to address, or, or can we? Yeah, so you're right. It's, it's an interesting thing, because this uses Juice, we're not technically directly calling the plugin APIs, we're calling through the Juice API. So really what we're validating is Juice audio processor. Um, whatever it decides to do to implement those formats is part of the test case. For us as a DAW, and there's a lot of Juice space hosts out there, that's kind of what we wanted to test because that's our use case. Um, there's been arguments, or let's say debates, about um, behavior internally um, on the kind of the juice side of things, like you mentioned, the lock. I don't know whether it's the right thing or not for juice to do that. It probably depends on the plugin format um, and behavior anecdotally from hosts, whether you can get away with that or not. What I would say is the things that we're testing are things that are allowed by Juice audio processor. So we're gonna really hammer those things. Um, this doesn't really answer your question, but. <laughs> yes, uh, so I guess you could have a, what, what did Jules call it earlier, insane mode? Uh, yeah, maybe add an insane mode that takes off all those uh, safety harnesses. There's, there's other things that I would like to do, actually. I mentioned there's a whole bunch of validation tools like the ST scanner and things like that. It would be really cool to be able to call those directly from plugin valve. So we open up testing everything. So um, not only do we run our own test, but we run AU is difficult because it has to be installed. But you know we could call other scanners as well as part of this process where possible, and that might catch other behavior. Um, there's things that would be cool to add to plugin Val, like just running the tests for an hour. You know, so you get a huge uh, rare variation and repeating tests and doing it in different orders, things like that. And if we can run other validation processes as part of that repetitive test, then we just kind of test as much as we can. And that's really the message here is test, test, test. Hope you find things. Well, I hope you don't find things really, but if you do, you've got information to fix them. Is there another question? Yeah. One down. Uh, maybe a little bit of uh, I, I didn't see if you are testing multiple instance of the same plugin or multiple formats at the same time of the same plugin or um, some weird stuff like that. There aren't any tests for that at the moment, but that's a good one. I did. Uh, I think that's on my list, at least to test the same uh, multiple instances of the same mm -hmm. plugin because um, obviously they share resources yeah. and things. That would be really good to do. Um, testing multiple versions could be interesting. Yeah. Um, I guess if we pass in a list of multiple files to be tested, <coughs> we could just say, hey, run all of these tests at the same time and see what happens. Yeah. So that and would be cool to have. And uh, the bonus is uh, multiple plugins, because sometimes you, when you have multiple plugins yeah. of the same manufacturer, yeah. you can have Issues. Yeah, so I would say we don't do that at the moment, but that's a really good okay. thing to test. And it's also very common in hosts to have, you know, half a dozen instances of a single plugin. Yep. Yeah. Uh, did you have some pla plan to, to test UI? Um, 
Gotcha. Yeah. So everyone asks you. So UI is UI is really hard. Um, we do open the editor and close it a few times in a few different scenarios just to check that that doesn't crash. Actually checking it produces the right output is difficult. Um, we have had discussions of at least trying to like take a screenshot and then comparing it to some known output to know whether it comes up blank or not. But that doesn't necessarily identify if you have a button misplaced or something like that. Um, I don't really know of a cross-platform way to do that yet. So if anyone has any ideas, that'd be good. Um, but no, we can't test those things at the moment, I'm afraid. I think there's a question over there. Thank you. Um, yeah, I thought it was a really, really cool initiative. Um, I have a two-part question. Yeah. One, does it work for Linux? Yes. Um, and you mentioned you can track uh, memory allocations in the audio thread. Yes. Can it be used or expanded to track even more uh, system calls done from so the audio thread? So as I mentioned, uh, when it checks memory allocations, it doesn't do like an S-trace type thing because you need debugger hooks to do that. Okay. that, that was what I was sort of That could check things like malloc and any other system calls. Um, what we do is we implement operator new so we can find out when calls go through that. And then there's, you, it's all open source, you can take a look, but there's essentially thread locals that turn a switch on and off to say whether they're allowed to allocate in that thread or not. And then we can check them. So that will check for possibly silly mistakes, you know, if you're accidentally calling a vector reserve or something like that in your audio thread. Um, or if you're, if you're new to the world of plugin development, you might be newing all over the place. Maybe you come from Java. Um, you know, it, those kind of things it will spot, but um, it doesn't do S-trace type things, I'm afraid. Okay, thanks. I think there's a question over there. So something that uh, was not so clear, is it possible to test MIDI events, MIDI messages? Um, for example, so for a synth synthesizer plugin. So at the moment, we have some randomly generated, if it's a synth, we will randomly generate a note on and off like every other block. So it will check some random input. Um, but that's not really ideal because you might have a long attack or something on your synth. But so what we're hoping to do is add um, input where you can specify a MIDI file and it will just play that entire thing. Um, so that will be really testing kind of the full capabilities of synths. But that's not quite in there just yet. Does that answer your question? Is there another one? Hi. Um, uh, you mentioned CI. Um, you mentioned what, sorry? Uh, CI, continuous integration. Oh, command line interface. CI, continuous integration, yeah. Yes. Um, I just wondered if there's like uh, recommended ways y to use plugin val, like uh, with like post commit hooks, or do you run stuff on a server? Um, so, the way I've found um, RCI to run, um, it was a good experiment I ran at the weekend, actually, because I was started on a different CI. We run Jenkins locally for all of our plugins, and that's largely because um, it's there, and also to build and upload our plugins requires an iLock, so it has to be plugged into a physical machine. Um, so I, when I was I don't know if anyone's ever used Jenkins, but it's an interesting experience. And <laughs> I basically realized I had to completely redo the way I was doing things and across multiple different platforms. So what I realized the best way to do this was just to try and get it down to one script that could run for each different platform. And then I would, the, the bit that is Jenkins is tiny. It's basically just um, a clone and then run this script. So I've been taking that approach for the last year or so, and it's worked quite well, because it means I can tear down CI, build them back up again. And at the weekend, I moved over to Travis, because I thought, oh, everyone's using Travis. This is an open source project. It would be cool. Basically, I just wanted to get the, the badges. Um, and I couldn't do that with Jenkins, because of reasons. Um, yeah, so I thought, oh, how, how hard is it to move to Travis? And actually, it was really easy because I had this one script that I could just call. So if you can put all of your tests into a script that you can call, I think they basically, they 
um, build the producer, then they build the plugin, then I build all the examples in the juice examples folder, and then I validate all of those with plugin val. That's kind of my test harness at the moment. But you can do anything in there. You can open up the binary, you can run unit tests. Um, if your repository has other plugins in it or you build other plugins, you can then test them. So whatever you can do in there, really. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Hi, oh, thank you, great okay. talk. Um, I, I have a question about uh, the random testing. Uh, when Sorry, could you just repeat that? I have a question about the random testing. Yeah. Um, if something fails, uh, is there a way to uh, rerun the same tests with the same seed and maybe debug? Yes, so in the version that I showed there isn't, but in the one on GitHub um, has an option where you can set the random seed and you can set it as hex or, or binary. And then that means if you get a report that has that seed listed, you can just rerun the test in that, maybe in debug mode, um, so you can actually find out more information. Okay, great, thank you. I think we're out of time. So thanks very much.